you know, until Johann Nepomuk Hofzinser called Playing Cards the Poetry of Magic. A conjurer's skill was determined entirely on his ability to perform one effect. That was called the cups and balls. There are many people who will tell you it's the oldest effect in the history of magic. That on the tombs of the King Beni Hassan of ancient Egypt, there are representations of Nile magicians doing the cups and balls. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I will tell you the game was known to the Greeks and Romans, that Seneca wrote about it, that the earliest iconography in our venerable art, the famous planetary drawings of Ulm in the 15th century, do show cups and balls conjurers. The game has been played continuously for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. With your kind permission, I'd like to end my performance this evening by showing you my version of this classic, which I call the history lesson. In 1584, Reginald Scott wrote the first practical treatise on conjuring in the English language. And in it, he spoke about putting a ball under a common object, like a uh, candlestick. He also said one might use a salt cellar, a bowl, or even a cup. And if the conjurer was clever, he could make the ball vanish and appear almost at will. Only a short time later, the game was played with bowls of china, played in the Orient. Anthropologists love the concept of independent invention. In Western Europe, it was played with cups of cheap metal, like tin, which on occasion had the strange ability to seem uh, penetrable. <laughs> this evening, I'm going to use cups of spun copper, personal favorites for a reason I will not reveal. <laughs> One of the things I love about this game is it independently exists in the genre of the gambler as well as the magician. This is a scene you may remember as the old three shell game. On the English race course, it was called thimble rigging. In the language of the hustler, it might be known as the hinks, the dinks, the blocks, or the nuts. The idea that you'd either put a ball or pretend to put a ball under one of the cups, but the ball would appear where it was least likely. Once again, if I place the ball over here and I move this, Moving these cups, you might think the ball was here, but it jumps to over here. One last time. This is why people have been known to lose houses and even clothing playing this little game. <laughs> One last time, if I place the ball here and move that to here, the ball now jumps as well. Now, a conjurer would do this in a slightly different fashion. The conjurer would take the object, put it in his hand, make it vanish using a magic wand. Conjurers also cheat. They use uh, many of them. Actually, the game was traditionally played with three cups and three balls. I'm going to show you an actual sequence of events from a 17th century bestseller called Hocus Pocus Jr. The idea here that I will cover the center ball with a cup and place one on top. Then I'll actually cover this and try to make the ball penetrate solid through solid, joining its mate below. Now that you know the sequence, why don't you follow it again? This time a ball penetrating through two solid copper cups. This method, a personal favorite of Matthew Buchinger, the little man of Nuremberg. He was only 28 inches tall. The cups obscured almost his entire body. <laughs> Look, that's enough for three balls to appear below. Matthew Buchinger had no arms or legs, but he did have 14 children. <laughs> the most famous man to ever play the game, the Italian Bartolomeo Bosco. Bosco appeared in the beginning of the 19th century, he cut an unusual figure on stage. He wore a black satin waistcoat, black velvet trousers. He made sure his sleeves were carefully rolled up. He took out his magic wand and polished the tip, a wand which he said was made of a strange amalgam of metals known only to himself and Erasmus of Rotterdam. Above his table was a brass bell. He hit the bell and said the words, Spiritae mihi in infernali obedite, infernal spirits obey my command. Bosco sequence with the cups and the balls. Vade. Jubio. Celerator. Three gone, and yet three. Return. Bosco had only one contemporary rival, the slightly older Frenchman named Conus, who in 1795 announced that he would make his wife, who was five foot seven, appear under one of the cups. <laughs> Practice though I have, I have been unable even to get married. <laughs> wouldn't even touch these with his hand. 
Actually, he said the only reason a magician used three was to confuse you. So he took one ball and placed that aside in his pocket. He took the second ball and also placed that away. It still left one ball over here, but it didn't explain how this ball came back. <laughs> Conus explained it. He said the magician did a feint. He only pretended to take the ball. Actually, what he did was to pretend, put his hand back, and then insinuate the ball under the cup. Conus said, I do no such thing. When I place the ball in my pocket, it really stays there. How could it come back, and indeed where? Perhaps back to the 16th century. Oh. Many of you may prefer the game the way it was played in the Orient, with two balls and two balls. Or you might prefer the European version with three cups and three balls. And if you have been paying attention, you know there would be one ball under the center cup, but now there are three. And that's the way the game was played for another 120 years until it was revolutionized once again by Max Molini, the man I spoke of earlier. Molini would take three glasses and wrap them in newspaper. He would take a cork from a wine bottle and cut it into three sections. He would take the three sections of cork and place them in his pocket. Then fashioning an impromptu wand out of a celery stalk or an asparagus spear, he would tap the glasses and say, Spirit I me in for nale obedite, or anything else that came to mind. And that's the mystery of the cups.